if I was running the BBC or whatever, I would say, well, this is going to be open anyway. So don't anybody think there are things that can remain permanently hidden. Um, uh, the world has moved on and people will expect accountability about things they didn't use to. As you've heard, Russell Brand has been blocked from making any money from his videos on YouTube. The video platform has argued that Brand has breached the company's creator responsibility policy. Russell Brand continues to deny the allegations of rape, sexual assault and predatory behaviour. Now, earlier we spoke to Times Radio's and the Times columnist Hugo Rifkind, who's written in today's paper about the naughty's culture that allowed for this kind of behaviour to go untapped. We'll always look back at our time and be a bit shocked at the things that we didn't quite raise our eyebrows enough at, mm. you know, while, while they were going on. But I think, I mean, the reason why the early 2000s seemed like a great time, it's kind of this, it's kind of for the same, it's, it's the same reason. It's because there were no consequences. Mm. It's because when a, when a comedian made the sort of jokes of the, the Russell, like Russell Brand did, sort of, you know, jokes about, I mean, f fairly horrific and misogynistic jokes, jokes that are actually not that similar to the kind of things that Andrew Tate will say today on, on a video and, and, and people will be shocked that they're being watched in schools. But when those kind of jokes were made back then, there was no consequence. Everyone could laugh along. There was not a culture of thinking about anybody who might be affected by this, anybody who might be offended by this. There was no such thing as a trigger warning. There was no sort of uh, outrage industry that floated along in the background. And that made it an easier time to be alive in, particularly if you were in the media. But that doesn't kind of mean it was right. And you look back now and you think about the things that that accommodated, and it's hard not to worry about it. Uh, that was Hugo Rifkind uh, talking there. And Akezia Dugdale, um, Hugo talks about the lack of consequences back in the early noughties. Um, but are there consequences now? We, we hear this morning that uh, the monetization from Russell Brand's uh, YouTube channel uh, has been uh, halted, suspended by YouTube. Um, from what we understand, because they uh, think that he's breached some kind of moral code. So we're not talking here about anything legal uh, or anything like that, but it's just a, a kind of morality clause. Is that the right way to go about things, do you think? It represents a holding pattern, doesn't it? It allows a big company like YouTube to do something in the moment of a, of a great scandal and a great controversy. Uh, I suspect it might change its patterns in the future once we know a bit more about what's exactly happened with this series of um, alleged behaviours from Russell Brand. And, you know, look, hearing Hugo Rifkind speak very sensitively and carefully about what's happened, I couldn't help but think, you know, we used to think the night the thousands were so much better than the 90s and the 90s so much better than the 80s and in truth this sort of behavior has been going unchecked for decades and it's still women's experience today I mean I could only watch the first 10 minutes of that documentary for just this overwhelming sense of despondency because once again here was some alleged predatory behavior some people suspected nobody did anything because of power structures you know rinse and repeat it, it ever was this way um, William Haig, what have you made about uh, the allegations surrounding um, Russell Brand and the culture to which it speaks, the kind of early uh, noughties? Um, do you, were you aware of that at the time? Do you look at it in retrospect and think, actually, my goodness, things have changed for the better now? Well, I think things have changed uh, for the better, but I'm not, I wasn't aware of that many cases at the time but definitely we now have different standards uh people feel able to call something out that they didn't call out before and others will respond to it like you've just been talking about youtube but went that where they might not have done before um so then you get individuals with predatory behavior or whatever who are caught out by the changing of the times and uh, organizations are caught out so it would be quite a good idea for broadcasters and others to say, well, who have we got on our books who is going to be the, uh, you know, who's the open secret? Because that's the, uh, a lot of the discussion about Russell Brand is, well, it was an open secret in the entertainment industry. Well, it's it's time to look at all the other open secrets and say, uh, if there are any other, and say, well, okay, perhaps we ought to be distancing ourselves from those people because times have changed. But William, do you think, because we had a kind of open secret discussions, we've had them in the last year or so, so very recently, if you if we do open these all up, all these secrets, w will it just be too much to bear, actually? Because there might be, it's quite possible that there are an awful lot of these people in recent history 
um, who for whatever reason have been indulged, who've been excused, who, you know, TV executives, radio executives, whatever, have turned a blind eye to. Is this actually a box that we can afford to open? Well, I think it will be opened anyway. You know, this is an example of it. Um, so if I was running the BBC or whatever, I would say, well, this is going to be open anyway. So don't anybody think there are things that can remain permanently hidden. Um, uh, the world has moved on and people will expect accountability about things they didn't used to. So um, so I think they won't have that choice, really. I think, um, as I say, things will be called out. We have to remember that, that people sometimes are the victim of unfounded allegations, mm. of course. So it's really important not to rush to judgment about somebody. But the one of the uh, strange things here is that the defense seems to be, well, it's all a conspiracy. But it would have to be a very elaborate conspiracy <laughs> by the Times and the BBC. Yes. And... Um, that isn't much of a defence, really. Um, Kezia, the BBC uh, has been asked, uh, There's uh, s the Times and the Sunday Times have submitted freedom of information requests to the BBC. They want to know uh, information about concerns raised by staff who worked with Russell Brand, who was a presenter, of course, on Six Music and um, Radio 2. And it said that it could not publish information about any such complaints because this could include Brand's personal data and that even confirming or denying whether or not that information information exists would be unfair. Do you think that the BBC should release, um, if not uh, names, but the number of complaints that have been filed against Russell Brand? Does that then does that then help other people to come forward? Of course they should, and of course it would. And that's a ridiculous response from the BBC. People handle FOI requests all of the time with the ability to redact information that might be on the scope of that legislation because it's of a particularly personal nature, an address or a telephone number or an identifying mark, whatever it might be, there are ways of handling that. I think that's a, a, a really, really disappointing um, BBC response, and I suspect it, it won't hold um, for much longer. I've looked at the issue of sexual harassment in politics before now. Um, we did a report in the Scottish Parliament when I was still there about incidences of sexual harassment within the building and tried to find some of the best systems in the world for responding to it. And th there is a model uh, that I think comes from Italy called the Callista model, where you can have uh, anonymous reporting that acts as a bit of a flag or trigger system. So women, and it so often is women, can report incidences by men without disclosing their name. And then they are contacted once there are X number of reports against that man in the system. Them, and then they're told you are part of a group of women there are safety in numbers you can choose now collectively almost to use it as a, as a class action approach to going a step further mm. so that the victims can kind of link arms and, and step forward together because to do it on your own when there are hierarchies of power like we've seen you know across the entertainment industry or in politics it is almost impossible and it's incredibly risky and, and these are some of the things we have to break down if there's any hope of, of cracking this in the long term. Yeah, and, and just one final point on the conspiracy theories, uh, the conspiracy theory defence um, that's been mounted that William Hague was talking about. I mean, is there a concern, or perhaps there isn't, that the, the kind of um, the stock response now that this is a conspiracy, this is the mainstream media, et cetera, et cetera, you're trying to tear down one of our heroes. Has that now replaced the previous response, which would have been, well, there's no harm, um, it's just a bit of a joke, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Do you have a concerns about that? Or do you think that this will, these kind of, um, well, I don't know, do you think these kind of conspiracy theories will, will, will disappear, will reduce? I think those conspiracy theories um, are problematic because they can happen on platforms that are unregulated, like your radio station is or like a newspaper is. So they can get an awful lot further at far greater speeds than they ever could before. And that's what makes them so dangerous. So in amongst all of this uh, requirement to have a response to sexual harassment, there is still outstanding business about regulation of the media and new forms of media in particular. Mm. 
Yeah, and the problem with the conspiracy theories is they, they're self-fulfilling prophecies, aren't they? As soon as you say that it exists, everything you see through that prism then confirms in your own mind that it does exist. So every time anything it goes against the people you support, you say, well, that, that proves my point. I, that, that's why I support them. And, and therefore, you just spiral into increasing madness. Um, let's talk about uh, consultants in England are starting their 48-hour strike this morning. Tomorrow, they'll be joined by junior doctors. That's the first time both groups will have ever conducted joint strike action. A pay offer has already been made by the government. Consultants are being given 6% and junior doctors an average of 8.8%, depending on their level. Both groups are asking for a further increase. But speaking to Times Radio this morning, the Health Secretary Steve Barclay told us that the deal on the table is fair. The number one ask of the BMA was to to make an extremely generous change to uh, pension taxation, which uh, the government did. Uh, In addition, we've accepted in full uh, the independent pay review body uh, request, which means for a junior doctor starting on the wards this summer, a pay rise of up to 10.3%. The average pay rise for a junior doctor is 8.8%. And I think for many of your listeners to Times Radio will will think, well, that's more than they themselves uh, are receiving. So we've responded to the, the number one ask of the BMA in terms of consultants. We've accepted in full the recommendations uh, of the pay review body uh, process. But we've also got to get inflation down. We've got to be fair to uh, those working in our armed forces, our teachers, uh, our nurses and paramedics covered by the Agenda for Change, an agreement we have reached with over a million staff across uh, the NHS. And we've also got to be fair to, to other workers in the private sector too. Steve Barclay there. William Haig, I'm going to demote you from uh, National Treasure to being Health Secretary again. Um, not even before, but you, you're back in the cabinet, you're now health secretary. Um, would you be talking to junior doctors and consultants? It is striking that Steve Barclay's not sat down and negotiated with them for 100 days. The surgeon we had on today, sorry, the consultant we had on today said, all we want is to carry on negotiating, and he's not willing to do that. This is the final offer, it's on the table, and that's it. If you were health secretary, William Hague, would you be carrying on negotiating, or would you be doing what? What's the, what's the short-term plan here? Well, you can ask that of either side, of course, what is the short term plan or the long term plan of the BMA and others, because I don't see how they can end this with what they want with a Conservative government or a Labour government uh, in the future. So uh, on the question about negotiating, I thought what we just heard the health secretary say was totally reasonable and explained the whole position. You know, they have a rise that's already happening above the rise in earnings of other people, a whole plan for recruitment in the future, you know, changes to pensions that have benefited uh, doctors and others. That's totally reasonable. So what the, I'd, if I was health secretary, of course, I'd be asking the official, well, what's your advice? Should I negotiate further? But the question would be, well, what are you going to negotiate about? Because you can't give them any more. And so uh, that's the position the health secretary is in. And I think almost any health secretary would be in. But would you hold so it that? it does require... But would you hold out, now. William? I guess the question is, can you can you hold out on that position till the next election? Uh, well, I th- you have to hold out on it because um, the country hasn't got any more money. Mm-hmm. Um, and uh, people are paying high taxes as it is. Health service spending is going up a lot as it is. Uh, and uh, it's very important to be able to support people who are uh, during the cost of living crisis. So you can't actually just conjure up billions more uh, for this or give in to every group who demands that they are a special case. So actually, I do I do back up the government. As I say, I think any alternative government would be in the same position. And I think introducing minimum service levels uh, in the coming months would be absolutely the right thing to do. Because yet- if that's the position, then it's hard to see how this ever ends because uh, it depends where the public opinion goes, I guess. I mean, I think people have hardened a bit in terms of Times Radio listeners. They're consultants, it feels to me. Um, they've actually lost more money than others in, in relative terms over the last uh, 10 years. The Times did an investigation into that and, and demonstrated that. But they still earn a lot of money. They still have very good pensions. Um, they're still very, very important in order to make sure that care exists for people and I wonder whether public opinion ultimately turns on them if they carry on striking. Possibly, um, but the public opinion is still very much behind NHS workers uh, across the spectrum. There's lots of evidence to show that the public um, are more supportive of NHS staff striking, for example, compared to, to train drivers. That's quite uh, understood. 
But, you know, I, I, I think there's a huge failure here from Steve Barclay's perspective. He should be negotiating. The minute that he agrees to talks, he can avert strikes and support all of those people who are very worried right now about their elective procedures being cancelled or you know, having another delay to their cancer treatment or whatever that might be. And it's, it is ridiculous that he is not prepared just to sit around a table and discuss uh, the, the demands from workers. And bear in mind, some of this is about pay, but it's not exclusively about pay. Some of the unions that are out in strike today are striking because of staff shortages. Uh, there are unions saying that their current working environment is unsafe because they're so short staffed. So the irony then for the government to be saying, well, it's a time for minimum minimum service level guarantees, it, you know, is a bit rich in that perspective when the whole NHS is crying out for better pay and more staff. Just before we move on, William, what about the, mar the market forces argument? If people can't get money here, they'll go to Australia, America, New Zealand, where they'll get a better quality of life, more respect, less drudgery, more money. And therefore, actually, you might not think we've got any more money, William, but market forces dictate we have to start paying people more, otherwise we won't have enough people to work in the NHS, full stop. Well, that is an important argument, but that's why there's this, um, as was announced a few weeks ago, and Steve Barclay just referred to it, this whole plan for recruitment for the future of the NHS. Uh, and that is all built into it. That all takes into account the salary levels uh, that will be available. So again, you, you in the public sector, you just don't have an infinite pot of money mm. available. And, and just one final point on negotiations. An important consideration here is that many other professions settled their pay claims on the basis of the pay review bodies. If you do that and you say, well, that OK, that's fine. You, there was nothing more to gain by negotiating. But then one group says, oh, no, we're not happy with our pay review body. We want to go on negotiating. Well, then where are you next year with all the people who did settle? So well, if you think about it from the government's point of view, that's one reason they don't want to negotiate further. Uh, we're going to talk in a minute about what it might be like to live to 100 <laughs> possibly excruciating. <laughs> Hopefully we won't still be in this studio. <laughs> Can you imagine? <laughs> no, I can't imagine. Um, right, William, before that, you've written in your column today that leaders across the board, from government to business, need to prepare for a Donald Trump presidency. So, so this is a dead cert, is it? No, it's not a dead cert, but it's uh, it's on the edge of becoming probable, I say in my <laughs> column. You know, it's really possible. It's sort mm. of 50-50. But a 50-50 chance of a very big event is something you have to prepare for. And my point is also others are preparing for it now. You know, dictators around the world, Putin in particular, will be actually working towards it. Uh, they're prolonging the war in Ukraine to the point where there might be a different president with erratic behavior uh, and using social media bots and so on. Uh, to influence people, to divide them in the United States. So this has actually started, in a way, the uh, the effect of Trump and the, his possibility of returning on world politics has already begun. And therefore, if the bad guys are going to be exploiting it, the good guys have to get ready for it and speed up a lot of things that we are doing. Like what? Well, uh, first of all, uh, they have to go up several gears in defending democratic societies against that um, abuse, uh, foreign infiltration and abuse of social media. Uh, but also it means we have to accelerate support for Ukraine, make sure we've got a credible strategy for uh, the Sahel region of Africa that would work even without the United States. Uh, we have to make sure that uh, on climate negotiation, that if the U.S., pulled back on its climate commitments, that we could put carbon border taxes on goods that are coming in that don't meet those commitments. So there's quite a lot to get mm. ready for what could be a big change in world affairs. Um, Kezia, uh, we'll come back to you in a second uh, because there's something quite interesting, well, a second interesting, very uh, interesting nugget there, which we'll come back to in a second. But Kezia, how are you preparing for the possibility of a second <laughs> Donald Trump presidency? By digging a hole? <laughs> <laughs> hoping for the best I think William's absolutely right there's no point waking up the day after this happens and thinking oh goodness what we're going to do now especially as all the things he lists in his column are things that um, make sense to do now regardless like redouble our efforts in um, Ukraine and also protect ourselves against any big nation stepping backwards on its climate change commitments it's absolute, absolutely right thing to do um, I, I really hope he's wrong though about the probability of Trump's success um, William, you say in the middle of the column that um, Joe Biden should step down and make way for someone 
are more likely to beat Trump, which I'm sure many people will agree with, uh, really. But um, that doesn't, you know, that seems unlikely. Well, uh, it, it, at the moment, it looks unlikely. Um, although, of course, perhaps if you were Joe Biden and you thought you might not stand again, you'd wait until a, a late stage to say so, so as not to become a... Um, you know, a complete lame duck. Mm. Um, but it is a big concern that once somebody is into their 80s, um, well, that should they be holding one of the most demanding jobs in the world? Um, uh, the, you can have very active people in their 80s, but being president of the United States is something else. And uh, that is going to be a drag on him getting elected. And for Trump to get elected for that reason, uh, would you know, legitimately elected, uh, would could be a disaster for American democracy. And they've got lots of good governors coming up, actually on both sides of American politics. And uh, it's time both sides made way for fresh leadership. Mm. Well, Donald Trump's no spring chicken either. Anyway, on the topic of age... Yeah, exactly. Okay. I, I want to come back to, uh, to to an American politics dress code as well by the end. Oh, yes. This morning is very good. Let's talk about old age first. It's 2061. Imagine this. We're all wishing William Hague a happy 100th birthday. <laughs> Kezia's merely 80. Asma's 89. Yes. I'm 81. We'll all be holograms. Everything we say will be automatically improved by artificial intelligence. William will have just written another column about abolishing the triple lock. <laughs> <laughs> Pensions will now represent 98% of all public spending. Um, who wants to live till 100? Kezia, now, in our 40s, 100 feels a long way away, and I feel relatively confident of saying, I don't want to live till I'm 100. But maybe when I'm 80, I'll think differently. Where, where are you on this? But, Stiggs, even you were 10, did you think 40 was basically dead? Yes, I, I know did. I did. Yeah, I did. <laughs> so I, I think I, that I now, think there's an element. <laughs> now I'm like, oh, you know, 80, 80 sounds all right. I, I could have a go at getting to 100. But, you know, like in, in public policy terms, I find this fascinating. Ten, 10 years ago, I was Labour's education spokesperson in Scotland, and I went to Finland and was bowled over by the fact they were planning then for 25% of their population to live to 100. And we're thinking about what that would mean for housing and for health and for just general community and the kind of well-being of society we are not even at the races in that regard there's so much to do on this and it's really exciting it's, it's, it's a positive thing it's good news as long as we react to it well and put the right steps in place and more women than men so maybe there'll be a garanto gynocracy in place uh, uh kezia of just of just uh, 85 year old women running for president uh, and then Sounds fabulous. I'm there. <laughs> William, where, I mean, the public policy point is very difficult in lots of ways. It's 14,000 centenarians in England and Wales at the moment. In Japan, one in 10 people are now aged 80 or older. Um, do you fancy sticking out to 100? Oh, yeah, definitely. As, uh, with good health. I knew it's it. It's health yes. span. Of, <laughs> that matters more than... Am I so predictable? Uh, uh, health span matters more than lifespan. And uh, there are some great 100-year-olds around. You know, Henry Kissinger turned 100 earlier this year. Not only does he keep, uh, he's kept producing books in recent years. He gave a really important interview about how to conduct world affairs that was full of wisdom. He's not an well, unmixed actually, blessing. He's not an unmixed blessing, though, is he, Henry Kissinger? Well, he, I think it's an unmixed. I think it is an unmixed blessing that we get the advice of somebody okay. who's 100 who's many things in the way you might not agree not everybody is going to agree with him uh of course and so i think this problem is being understated uh or this opportunity because uh, there will be such advances in medicine and biotechnology over the coming decade um that actually you know if you live through that once you've lived through that period well, you find a lot of your body parts can be replaced and a lot of diseases can be detected early. So I think there will be more centenarians in the year you were describing than in these forecasts that we're seeing today. Yeah, and, and that but the will... triple lock is toast, right? We can expect <laughs> that. Well, it would probably, I know Stig was joking, it would probably be more than 100% of GDP uh, <laughs> by then. And we have to get used to that of working much longer. But while I don't think Biden should be president of the United States when he's 85, I think there should be a lot more people who are working in their 70s if they enjoy it. Mm -hmm. and, if, yeah, if, uh, that's a, and that's the if, isn't it? 
yeah, that is the end. Yeah. Uh, before you go, uh, both of you, uh, US senators will be allowed to wear shorts and hoodies after this dress code has been scrapped in Washington. We'll come to you in a second, William, because I'm just trying to make the mental image in my mind of, of this. I wear sh shorts and hoodies pretty much all the time. Even I, Kezia, I think would say you can't wear that in the Senate. But, you know, I hate dress codes. I never go anywhere with a dress code. Maybe I should support this. Would you support the House of Commons in that people are allowed to wear shorts and hoodies? I think there should be an age limit on men wearing shorts, <laughs> definitely, um, more so than an age limit on Where would you presidency. put that? Where would you put that? Uh, 40, 41. 55. 55 is like, a good one. I, I think even William might be a bit old for shorts, dare oh. I say it, no matter how oh. good his legs are. Excuse me. He's already in a baseball cap, though. Yeah. <laughs> uh, William, uh, are you too old for shorts? You do have good legs. Oh my goodness! What's happened? Uh, yeah, I don't know how you know that, but the, uh, I've seen your no, legs. definitely not to wear. Stop to it. About, definitely not to wear in the U.S. Senate or the Houses of Parliament. Oh, you've got to have a dress code that shows respect for the institution mm. and other people. And once you break that, once you're not in a suit and tie in the U.S. Senate, well, where do you draw the line? You've got people in, you know, singlets and onesies and. <laughs> You know, yes! wandering around half Singlets. before you know it. So um, I think it's it's really important to uphold good dress well, standards in public institutions. Well, it's gone. They've, they've, they've made the changes. It's happened. I mean, it's it's because of that that uh, Fetterman, isn't it? John Fetterman. He likes to wear them, and uh, um, he's going to be allowed to. It's disgraceful. So, and he's where and I think he. I find out how old he is for you, Kezi, But I think he's close. <laughs> to, I think he's close to your ban. And William, that means you're not allowed to wear shorts in public either. You're happy to accept yeah. that. Uh, no, but I will not wear them anywhere near the Houses of Parliament. Uh, um, we not, must not let this happen to the mother country. We've got standards to uphold. Oh, we have indeed. And we try every Tuesday. Sometimes we fail at this time. Uh, William Hague and Kezia Dugdale, thank you very much. They're with us every Tuesday.